Hello and welcome to the Raptors Reaction Podcast. I'm your host, Samson Folk. Yes, the Samson Folk. That is a friend and colleague of Matt Chance, the guy who once drank a full bottle of maple syrup to impress a girl. The Raptors just beat the New York Knicks 117-92, to so I'll be detailing that win in detail for you. Ah, uh, yes, alliteration as an ode to Clyde Frazier and his great announcing. Anyway, 117-92, the Raptors had a bit of a laugher in this one. I wrote the preview for this game, and I suggested that they might go nuts from three. They did, actually, and it started off early. Marcus saw their... I guess Matt Devlin was talking about it. Leo was talking about it. They were suggesting that the new offense is pass the ball to Marcus Hall and cut. It wasn't quite like that early on. It was pass the ball to Marcus Hall, space out the floor. Maybe one guy moves, and then Gasol just finds the open man in the corner. The Raptors were raining from three point land very early on, and it just never really stopped. The third quarter, they didn't shoot it that well. The fourth quarter, featured everybody from the deep bench, whether it's Boucher, Miller, Meeks, Lynn. They all hit triples, and the Raptors finished with, I think it was 20 triples on the night, which is pretty crazy. It's a really, really good night from downtown. And it was easy to predict because the Knicks are bad at defending the three, and the Raptors, since Gasol's arrival, have been almost second to none shooting the three. And like I said, that was evident from early on in the game. An interesting thing to see in this game as well, even though it is against the Knicks, so anything that might be added to that, there is a bit of a you know an undercutting narrative that the Knicks are very bad. Trying for Zion, whatever else. Which is not a great saying, by the way, trying for Zion. We could do better. But anyway, um, Gasol, we saw a bit more mobile. He was a bit more mobile on defense early on than what we've seen. He wasn't dropping, which we've been accustomed to in previous games. He did he did trap a bit more against Charlotte, um, against Kemba, and in this game as well, we saw him very early space out to the corner on defense, and Siakam had a great rotation, blocked DeAndre rolling to the rim very early on. It was really aesthetically pleasing defensive play to watch, especially since it was Fred Van Vliet and Gasol who went out to the corner trapped, I think it was Emmanuel Moutier, and then Siakam had a perfectly timed defensive rotation to stop DeAndre Jordan at the rim. Things like that kept happening. Danny Green uh, just pulled up in transition anytime he could, and for that matter, just pulled up anywhere from the floor anytime he could. I mentioned in the quick reaction, but this was his 10th game of the year with five or more triples, which is kind of obscene, and it goes without saying now and you could, you could suggest that might be Pages Stojakovic, even though his chapter with the Raptors was even shorter than Danny Green's. But I think Danny Green is probably, by now, the very best three-point shooter that's ever played for the Raptors. Not Jason Capono, not Steve Novak, not Pages Stojakovic. It's got to be Danny Green. And the fact that his three-point shooting comes along with the just incredible defense that he plays very heady very aware really good when he's team oriented good enough for anybody in iso it's just a really welcome sight to have and yeah i hate to be the millionth guy who's made this joke but he was a throw-in in in the trade apparently as crazy as that is he's a guy who yeah he's the best three-point shooter in raptors history eric kareen penned I guess penned is probably not the right term to use since we all type everything, but he wrote a really good article fleshing that out. And beyond Danny and Capono and Stojakovic and Novak, Danny is the only one who is a viable 3 and D guy because of his defense. Danny Green's, uh, his, I guess, spot in Raptors history and him being a guy who will likely really want to return to the franchise is just starting and we might see him become one of those guys who we revere like a Doug Christie, uh, Charles Oakley, someone like that. I think he's got a really good shot at that and he'll be beloved by Raptors fans for a really long time and it all starts with this year and it all starts with his willingness to love the city, to, to engage with fans, do all that kind of stuff. Shout out to Danny Green. He started out the game like a monster 
And, yeah, he plays so well alongside Siakam and Marc Gasol. His ability to read the lanes, fill, cut, and then find the soft spots in the, on the like on offense is it's uncanny. Um, Hasonia, he he was he was okay. Um, he back cut Siakam a couple times. I just want to highlight it since Leo Routon suggested that Hazonia, if he were on the Raptors, might be a player. Uh, I guess that's an idea worth entertaining for a couple seconds. I tweeted out that I didn't think he would be part of the rotation, and I don't think he would be. I mean, if you're not better than Norm Powell, and I don't think he is, then you're not making into the Raptors rotation, at least not the playoffs, right? I, I would take Malcolm Miller over Mario Hazania. That might be a bit of homerism, and it probably is, but that's how I feel about that. And McCaw, why not? That's another <laughs> favorite to Matt Chance. I'll take McCaw over anybody, just for Matt Chance's sake. Um, Siakam stretched the floor from downtown and vertically on the fast break from the onset, from the jump, and he <laughs> kind of broke the Knicks' transition defense from very early on. DeAndre Jordan over the past three, four years hasn't been the most energetic player. He's been a you know, he's been a stay at home defender and he's kind of been living on his reputation from the earlier years of his career and he was not very excited or I guess engaged when defending Siakam or even entertaining the idea of, hey, I'm gonna get back on defense and I'm gonna stop that guy from running at the rim. And that just didn't happen. I mean, Kyle Lowry hit him with a three-quarter court pass for an alley-oop very early on. There was another play. I think it was Fred just found him streaking down the sideline because the Knicks jogged back on defense and Siakam ran. That's not an understatement. That is exactly what happened. And we got points because of it. As an NBA team, you just ran harder than the other team. And suddenly you're rewarded with very easy baskets. Some great chemistry we saw from Marcus Saul and Kyle Lowry. Um, Kyle Lowry was very, very present in the offense to start the game off. He had a really nice basket cut where Gasol just dropped it over his right shoulder. Lowry went right to the rim. And Lowry was very active, engaging in dribble handoffs with Van Vliet and Gasol. A lot of give and goes with those two players, which is really nice to see. And it's just an, another addition in the book of... Van Vliet and Lowry play terrific together. And in a game that has almost no meaning, right? Because the Raptors are going to be the two seed, probably. Everything else will shake out how it will, but that's probably what's going to happen. And the Knicks are a very, very bad team. And the Raptors just played a very, very bad team in the Chicago Bulls. What do you take away from a game like this? Nothing, really, except to try things out, hope to get a couple guys going, and to see fun things happen. There was, last year, DeMar DeRozan, Kyle Lowry, and mostly DeRozan last year, ran the pick and roll, and the team won games, and they succeeded. It was a bit monotonous, and I'm saying this is DeMar DeRozan being my favorite player of all time, and 100% is one of the best people, by all counts, in the NBA. People love him. The, The harder guys, the softer guys, everybody in between, everybody has love for DeMar, but that type of offense was kind of monotonous. Seeing everybody bounce around Gasol on the elbow and seeing passes get dropped off into the lane. Gasol found Danny Green for a three after bouncing it through somebody's legs when everybody was jumbled up in the corner. Things like that, they're they're not super common. And that type of offense is not super popular in the NBA today. But it is extremely fun to watch. That's a huge benefit of having Gasol is that later on in the year, we've been able to watch some pretty cool basketball a lot of chemistry, a lot of shared synergy between really, really, I guess what would be the term? It's a, it's a term for somebody who's quite intelligent. Uh, it's gone, but that's fine. <laughs> um, but a lot of players who are really smart when they're cutting, being aware of how the defense is playing them, filling gaps, finding cuts, when to time everything. Lowry, Siakam, Gasol, Van Vliet, Green, All these guys, they were playing such a fun brand of basketball early on. And that was was really special to watch. Um, Another highlight, Kevin Knox tried to post up Kyle Lowry. Why he did that, I don't know. I think the scouting report is out on that one. That's not something you might want to try and do. I mean, Kyle Lowry's talked about it openly. 
as he's also talked about his thickness openly. That's a chapter in his book that we can now all acknowledge and one that he has too. Um, Gasol, I guess I want to highlight, there was a really fun baseline pass that he kicked his leg up in the air, his left leg, and hooked the pass on the baseline and went to Danny Green for a triple. And it just made you realize that this team unshackled and just pass the ball around, shoot it. If shots are falling, the type of basketball they play is so aesthetically pleasing. Like, there's, I haven't enjoyed watching basketball like this very often from the Toronto Raptors. And there was a bit of angst that came with the other brands of basketball that we as a team played. But this one is just, there's so much free flow to it. There's so much clever passing, clever cutting, so much ingenuity in it. That is something you just really enjoy watching. And in a game like this where the Raptors were up by 30 at times and up by 20 for almost the whole game and maybe has a claim for one of the five games this year that they played a quote-unquote full 48, that's a, that's a great takeaway is to say, I had fun watching this team, even though you had to watch the G League team that is a, like across the court from them in the New York Knicks. Uh, just a quick highlight, post-injury Fred was a plus 47 in the six games since his injury before this game. And in this game, I'm pretty sure he was like a plus 23. He's been in rarefied form since coming back. When everybody spoke to him at practice, even after the Charlotte game, he seemed to be in a pretty good mood. And it's just great to see a guy who has had injury problems come back healthy and dominate in a way that he wasn't able to earlier in the year for him to return right back to the status of, oh yeah, I could take six man of the year. I really could. That's, and that's Fred right now. And inserting him into the starting lineup, 21-5 and five with him in there now, having him play with Kyle Lowry, it speaks, uh, it speaks volumes for his value on this team. And it's exciting for him to achieve this type of play style just before the playoffs. And hopefully we'll get to see that in the playoffs as well. Um, the second time, or sorry, we saw the big, big lineup tonight. And the big, big lineup means that Gasol is at center, Ibaka is at the four, and Siakam's at the three. Both stints went pretty well. They played a zone defense, which is, you know, that's a fun look. Um, shout out to Nurse for trying it out. Like I said, both stints went well, and it's largely a credit to um, Pascal Siakam because of his ability to seamlessly switch on to the, the shorter players and to keep up with those speedier players. Even before the big lineup was out there, you see him dodging screens, going under screens, bouncing around screens, guarding guys like Emmanuel Moutier, crowding them when they try to snake the pick and roll. And that's just him as a verified four, a power forward, contending with a guard on defense and having almost no trouble with it. His ability to go down to the three and now to space the floor and to dominate his mismatches at that position on offense makes the Raptors a very, very intriguing team, especially if they play that lineup. It's going to be very exciting, especially in the playoffs, if they play that lineup and can just throw it at a team for maybe a three, four minute stint. You give Kawhi, maybe Danny Green a break, something like that. And then you just throw that out there and completely mix up the team. It's going to be an overwhelming amount of size. It's not something you often see, but it, it could yield a lot of benefits. And at least tonight it did. I know it's against the New York Knicks, caveats, caveats. But it's, it was really, really fun to see. Um, I guess it's a good time to go on to the awards. But first I'll talk about Chris Boucher, Malcolm Miller, those guys. Really fun to see them tonight. Really happy to see them put up shots and make them. I really want to see... I'm, I'm okay with Boucher getting playing time and Meeks. I really want to see Malcolm Miller get a look at maybe like 20 plus minutes in a game towards the end of the year. I remember he started a game last year. Really fun. I, I like his playing style so much. And I think that the same way Alfonso McKinney went and just started playing for the Warriors and had a, a spot on their team. I think that Malcolm Miller can have a similar progression in his career. I think that Malcolm Miller is a real NBA player, a real eighth, ninth man who can shoot 37 to 40% from downtown and can defend. 
I think that there's a spot for him in the league, and I want to see him get a, a, a few more minutes. Happy for Jeremy Lin as well to kind of turn it around after a really tough start in this one. And I think that's as good a eulogy for this game as anything. The Raptors dominated from start to finish. The Mitchell Robinson Award uh, <laughs> goes to Mitchell Robinson. I believe he had 21 points and 19 rebounds in this game, which is absurd. It's especially since he came off the bench. Let me just check that. Sorry, 19 points and 21 rebounds. His length and tenacity and jumping ability all combined together make him a very intriguing piece going forward. And his villain status obviously still remains since the award is named after him. But if this was a closer game and the Raptors had to contend with a guy who put up 19 and 21, he obviously would earn the villain status that way as well. He was a huge problem for the Raptors in a game that didn't have any problems, as minimizing as that sounds. The Reggie Evans Award goes to Pascal Siakam, most improved player of the year, to my eye anyway. I know everybody's talking about Tracy McGrady's comments, things like that, whereas DeAndre Russell has become, quote-unquote, a leader, things of that nature. Yes, I like D'Angelo Russell a lot. He's a super fun player. His ability to snake the pick-and-roll, put players in jail. It's it's very fun, and I really like that his jumper has come along because he showed every part of his game, every part of his shot. It, it looked like it was supposed to be good, and to see it finally catch up has been rewarding as a fan of D'Angelo Russell. On top of that, um, if we play D'Angelo Russell in the playoffs, he'll probably average 28, and the Nets will lose in five or four games, and that would be pretty rewarding. But Siakam playing almost all-NBA-level defense, which he will get, you know, an accolade like that in his career. I'm almost certain of it. His ability to switch across all positions. His ability to have a mismatch on almost anybody opposing him on offense at any given time save for like three players league-wide, like Thaddeus Young and players of that ilk, Julius Randle maybe, even though Julius Randle can't really defend. Things like that and his ability and his work ethic to turn his corner three-point shot into a verified weapon for the Raptors' offense. Most improved player of the year, his tireless effort running the floor. The Reggie Evans Award has to go to him, and that's how I feel about that. Let me just load up the quick reaction because we're going to react to the quick reaction comment, the top one anyway. And I guess I'll quickly say this podcast is brought to you by Brian Goldfinger of Goldfinger Injury Lawyers. Thanks for sponsoring the podcast. And we're going to get into the quick reaction comment, the top one, and I'll react to it. Van City B-Ball. I'm not sure what is more difficult, beating the Knicks or taking something out of your right pocket with your left hand. Yes, um, kind of like an annoyance, something you wish you didn't have to do, but you do. I had the opposite problem. I broke my left hand, kind of smashed it up. Uh, my third and fourth metacarpals were broken, one in half, the other in four places, and that was my left hand. So I had to grab stuff out of my left pocket with my right hand quite a few times in my life, and now I have nerve damage in my left hand. So that's been fun. So I. I understand the feeling, Van City B-Ball, and I think that's also a great um, analogy for this game. It's, it's a slight annoyance, but it's something you're definitely capable of doing, and then by the time it's over, you're like, oh, well, that's just quite a simple motor function. And the way the Raptors are built right now, beating the Knicks is a pretty simple motor function. I hope everyone likes these analogies, and I hope everyone enjoyed the podcast. If you like this, you can go follow Raptors Public on Twitter, Instagram, at Raptors Public. And make sure you go to RaptorsRepublic.com. There's tons of great writing going up all the time. Louis Satsman has a piece coming out about Jama Malalela, and it's going to be fantastic. So check that out. I think it'll be out March 29th. So look for that on RaptorsRepublic.com. Thank you for listening so much. I've been your host, Samson Folk. Have a blessed day. And goodbye.